Hi there, friends. I hope that uh, you're doing well. I hope your week is going well. And I uh, hope that you'll be able to join us uh, this evening for the third installment of our Celebrate Jesus series. I have had so much fun with these the past couple of weeks. It's just such a, a nice, relaxed, laid-back atmosphere to eat together and just enjoy a good time of fellowship and then to enjoy just being reminded of the goodness of Jesus. Uh, if you'd like to join us, we'll uh, begin with a meal where in the Grace Room at 6 o'clock where everybody just brings their own food, pick up whatever you want on the way in. We eat from about 6 to 6.30 and then go in and watch another episode of The Chosen and then just uh, huddle up and, and pray together. It's, it's just a really sweet time together. hope you can join us for that. And I also want to remind you, I mentioned this this past Sunday, since July 4th falls on a Sunday this year, two Sundays away, uh, we're going to just really make a special day of that. It's going to be Celebration Freedom Sunday for us. And among other things, we're going to share a fellowship meal together. So uh, we would invite you to come at 9.15 on that Sunday. We're going to have breakfast together and just really is going to be a fun, special day. I'm, I'm very excited about what God's already given us for that day, and I don't want you to miss out on that. Well, we are almost through with our study in Ephesians, and uh, we're going to turn our attention there again to some of the closing verses. Uh, and as as we do that, I want to just first read a passage uh, to you from 2 Corinthians 10, where Paul says this. We've been talking about spiritual warfare, and Paul says this about warfare. He says, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. And the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's good news for us. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So it's a good word there that we're in this spiritual battle, and God has given us weapons that allow us to, to destroy strongholds. So what do those look like? Well, Paul speaks of these in uh, Ephesians 6, and I want to read you just a few verses there, beginning in verse 14. He says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, I've heard oh, countless teachings on this passage and on spiritual warfare and honestly, I found it a little bit frustrating that when people get to this passage, we love to talk about these things in glowing terms, but it's like virtually every message or teaching that I ever hear on this, I feel like I come away frustrated that I don't feel like anybody ever says anything of a great deal of practical value about, okay, how do I use these weapons in warfare? It, it's wonderful to say, we have the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. But in practical terms, what does that mean? What do you do with that? I, I hear people say, well, you need to put that on in prayer. And, and there's some truth to that. But I think for the average Christian, it's like, well, what does that even mean? What am I supposed to do if these are the weapons of my warfare? Somebody needs to teach me how to use these things. And so I want to just say a word about each one of these that I hope maybe will add a little more practical value to, to what Paul's speaking of here. So let's just take a moment to unpack each of these. He begins by saying, first of all, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And I want us to think about each of these different um, pieces. We say weapons of warfare. A lot of it's armament. So it's, it's both protection and it's also an offensive weapon or two. <clears throat> but I want us to think about how this applies to warfare and how do we practically use this. So the first one is the belt of truth in place. What does that have to do with warfare? Well, understand <clears throat> the place where warfare happens for us in our struggles with Satan and with demons, it's primarily in our minds. They want to deceive us. They want to tempt us. They want to mislead us. And so they're always working on our minds. They're always trying to, to give us twisted ideas, putting a spin on the truth. And Jesus said of Satan that he is the father of all lies. Every lie that, that you've ever heard ultimately came from the original source of evil. And so <clears throat> as we try and deal with the enemy, one of the most important things that we can do is to recognize lies and, and replace them with the truth. And so when he says, with the belt of truth buckled in place, one of the most practical things that we do in dealing with the enemy is we compare whatever's going on in our heads, whatever the voice in our minds is saying that may be bringing us down or discouraging us. We compare that to the truth. 
I heard a wise person say years ago, when you're struggling with something, you need to make sure that you separate facts from feelings. So many of us operate based on feelings, and, and feelings <clears throat> can be legitimate. We feel what we feel. We don't need to deny that. <clears throat> but so many times our feelings are not based on the truth. They're not based on facts. You can feel like, oh, my marriage is over, when the fact of the matter is you just had a little fight and you're going to be over it in a couple of hours. You, you can feel like, oh, I just feel like that this pain that I have is going to turn out to be cancer. It's, it's going to be awful. I'm, this is probably going to be the end for me. And then you find out it was something really minor. It was no big deal. You felt it so deeply, but the facts were very different from the feelings. And <clears throat> facts are rooted in the truth. And the truth is always rooted in what God says about anything. What God says in His Word, but also what God says through His Spirit to us about any situation. And so we need to pause when we are just really getting tangled up and bogged down and, and we're, we're feeling anxious, we're feeling afraid, we're feeling overwhelmed, we're feeling this gigantic sense of doubt or whatever. And just ask, what is the truth of this situation? What are the facts? What does God say about this? I know what I'm feeling. I know what's going on in my head, but that doesn't make it a fact. That's that's probably based on feelings or circumstances. What is the truth here? Because the truth will just stop the enemy in a moment. It, it shines the light of truth so that we recognize the lies of the enemy. So he says, first of all, put on the belt of truth. That means we need to always stop and ask, what is God saying about this? And what does God's word say about this? <clears throat> the second thing he says is, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. What does he mean by the breastplate of righteousness? Well, I think first and most importantly is this. Understand that in our, our struggles with the enemy, one of the biggest attacks that he brings against us is he tries to convince us that we are unworthy of God's love. And that we're not really God's children, that we're not really Christians, we're not actually saved. And he points out all of our failures and all of our sins and says, you couldn't be a Christian, you still struggle with this, you still struggle with foul language, you still struggle with lust, you still do this, this, and this. Don't you remember all the things that you've done in the past? God couldn't love you, you couldn't be a child of God. <clears throat> and we're tempted to try and answer that in our minds by trying to list off all of the good things that we've done as if we're going to balance this on, on a scale. And that's always going to lead to failure. The way that we resist the enemy and all of these attacks that he brings against us, and, and the scripture says in Revelation uh, 12 that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, that he's constantly accusing us. He's great at doing this. We don't answer by saying, well, well, I go to church now and I read my Bible three days this week and I've done, you know, I've given money and I've done these things. <clears throat> that never successfully overcomes the attacks of the enemy. We counter that by standing in the righteousness of Jesus. Remember, this is our marching order. Stand. We, we don't attack. We don't advance. We stand in, on the ground of what Christ has already done. The righteousness that I bear, that I wear, is the same that you wear, and that is the righteousness of Jesus. It is an imputed, it is an, a given righteousness. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.30, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. You didn't earn it. You don't achieve it. The righteousness that you bear is total righteousness. It is the perfection of Jesus. And so I don't have to pretend like I don't have struggles or failures. We just confess those things and lay them bare to God. The slate is wiped clean, and I, I just live then covered in the righteousness of Jesus. It's why John could say in 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all of our sins. And then he goes on to say, so if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The point here is we don't hide anything and we don't defend anything. We just lay it all bare before God. And if the enemy tries to accuse us of those things, we don't deny it or try and defend it and say, well, yeah, but look what I've done that's good. No, no, no. We can agree with the enemy. Yep, I did all of that, but guess what? God knows it. It's confessed. It's in the light. And so now I have fellowship with God and my brothers and sisters because the blood of Jesus has cleansed it. And I stand today secure in the righteousness of Jesus who has already declared me holy. The third thing that he says is with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Overcoming the enemy is always coming back to the cross. The cross is the, the place of victory for us. The gospel is all about the cross. 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, By this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the message that I first preached to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and He rose the third day according to the Scriptures. That, that's the gospel. That is the heart of it. It is the message of the cross, the gospel message. We don't ever advance beyond that. <clears throat> when we're dealing with the enemy, we don't have to do like advanced training in how to deal with him. We just constantly stand in the victory of the cross. And so <clears throat> we declare the message of the gospel. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is Lord, and he is my Lord. His death covers my sins. And so a major weapon of, of our warfare is to declare the gospel and to believe the gospel and to affirm the gospel again and again. I'll tell you, in warfare, it's one of the most common things that I do when it's a really a, a head-to-head deal where I know I'm dealing, I'm truly dealing with the enemy and I'm addressing the enemy. I go right back to the gospel and I say to the enemy, I, I remind you now of the Lord Jesus, of his death, of his burial, and of his resurrection and his victory at the cross of Calvary. So, You see, the cross and the message of the gospel becomes a major weapon of our warfare because we are just now standing in the victory that Christ has won. Trust me, every demon knows that was the day of their defeat. That was their D-Day. You know, in World War II, D-Day was the day that it, it basically, everything was over at that point. There was another year of fighting to be done, but once the Allies were able to establish a beachhead and get onto the continent of Europe again, the war was was won at that point. Well, our battle was won at the cross. There's still some struggling yet to be done, but the enemy knows it was won at the cross, and that's why the message of the gospel is so important. Verse 16, he says, And take up the shield of faith which, which you, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Boy, we've all felt the fiery arrows of the evil one, haven't we? He, he loves to fire those things at us, and it's usually in our minds, again, where <clears throat> whether it's a temptation or just a... <clears throat> a thought of of condemnation or of guilt or shame. We've, we've all experienced those kinds of things that just suddenly pop in our heads. And Paul said, the shield of faith guards us against the fiery arrows of the enemy. Well, what's that all about? What's the shield of faith? Hebrews 11.1 uh, 1 says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. That's the basic Christian definition of faith. Faith is a willingness to believe in what you can't see or prove right now. A lot of people have made the determination that they are not going to risk believing in things that they can't see. That that just feels too foolish, too risky for them. Christians choose the exact opposite. Christians choose to believe in a God that their eyes have never seen, to believe in promises that they cannot prove You can't be a Christian without doing those things. Faith is coming to the determination that there is far more in life that matters and that I can trust in than the things that I can right now see with my eyes or prove with my my thoughts or my actions. And when you make the choice that you are not just going to live in the realm of what you can prove and know in that sense... And you decide, I'm going to live my life by faith. I'm going to live my life believing in a person and in some ideas that I can't technically prove yet, but I'm going to choose to build everything on that. That is the game changer. So when we use the shield of faith, the enemy is trying to cause doubts and tell us, how do you even know that God's real? How do you know that God loves you? There's, there's no God. The Bible's an old book. Why would you believe that book? Faith becomes a shield for us to say, you know what? I can't prove those things, but I'm willing to bet my life on it, that God is real and that he does love me and that his word is true and that his promises, he's faithful to those things. And when I choose to believe what I can't prove, suddenly my heart and my mind are protected by that. And the fiery darts of the enemy aren't able to sink in and just create these deep, lingering fears and doubts. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, and take up the helmet of salvation. Again, this is tied to the idea of, of the message of the gospel. Our big, one of our biggest struggles with the enemy is that he wants to cause us to doubt our relationship with God. 
And as we put on the helmet of salvation, we are just reminding ourselves again and again, it is not based on what I've done. It is based on what Jesus has done. It is by grace that I've been saved through faith. Have I chosen to trust Christ? Yes. Then the grace of God saves me and I am secure. No one can take that from me. And then the final piece that he says is take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now we have an an offensive weapon in our hands. You know, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness prior to the launch of his ministry, he tried very hard to get Jesus a little off course in his thinking, to get him to misuse the power that he had, that he was really coming to terms with as, as he's fully understanding what it means that he is God and possesses all the power in the universe as God, and Satan wants to, to deceive him and, and make him mis- misuse that. And so Jesus uses the truth, he uses the word to counter the enemy, and we do the same thing. That's why it's so important for us every day to get a little more of the Word in us. It's so important for us to be under sound teaching of the Word, to to take time to journal when we've read the Word, because you know, as, as we take time to process and to write things out, they sink more deeply into our hearts and our minds. And so not just having some general sense of, I think the Bible says somewhere maybe something about, no, 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 getting into the Word to the point that we can declare this is what, the Lord says about this. And when it comes to warfare, the word is so incredibly important and powerful. When I'm really in a a major point of conflict where there's a stronghold that needs to be broken, whether it's in my own life or someone that I love or I'm ministering to, I will use the word. I read it aloud. I make it a part of warfare praying in those times where we're really having to press in on some issue. And I particularly will go to two things. I will go to passages that just honor and glorify God that are just passages of worship. I love to go to the Psalms as one major place. Uh, I love to go to Colossians where Paul is just bragging on Jesus and just the, the greatness of the Lord Jesus. Passages that just lift up the Lord and honor Him. The enemy hates that. He hates listening to that and it becomes an offensive weapon to force Him to flee. So I know that's a quick overview, but I hope that gives a little more of a handle for us on each of those things, how it's not. These aren't just words that we say, but these are truly weapons that we use. At the heart of all this is the good news. If you've trusted Christ, Christ lives in you, and all the power that raised him from the dead lives in you. And every day we can walk in victory over the enemy, but we've got to be faithful to do our part, submitting ourselves to God, actively resisting the enemy, faithfully doing this every day. I want to just pray for you before we go, so would you just take a moment to bow with me as we turn our our hearts and minds toward the Lord. Jesus, we just celebrate today how good you are. We celebrate your victory, your power over the enemy, and we thank you that you give us victory through what you've done at the cross. Jesus, we submit ourselves to you, and we pray that you would have your way in our lives and that your spirit would fill us and lead us. God, we pray today for Freedom Church here on the eastern shore and in Nigeria. Oh God, have your way in your church. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for lives that are being changed, for new people that you're adding each week. And we thank you for the fresh opportunity that is before us in Ida, Nigeria. And we just pray, oh God, that you would go before us, that you would prepare the hearts of many people that need to turn to you. We pray for a a great uh, step there that would see Islam pushed back and the gospel advanced. And Holy Spirit, we depend on you. We depend on you as we continue to reach out and plant. We depend on you as we just seek to live worthy of you in our homes and our families and in our workplaces. So please come. Live in us. We love you. We offer ourselves to you with grateful hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you have a great rest of the week. Hope you can uh, join in Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Take care.